Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rouse IAS. Subscribe to the only official Telegram channel of Rouse IAS Study Circle to stay updated. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of UPSC Civil Services Examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 22nd of March 2021. The articles which we are going to cover today have been displayed on your screen and the time stamping for the same has been provided in the description of the video. Let us now begin the discussion. Junk inefficiency is the column appearing on page number 8. Now this particular column talks about and appreciates the recent initiative by the government of India in form of vehicle scrappage policy. The much awaited vehicle scrappage policy announced by the transport ministry promises economic benefits, a cleaner environment and thousands of jobs says the column. And then it says that the scrappage policies and the incentive provided in this particular policy should be limited to the electric vehicle component. But that is just a minor suggestion. From the perspective of prelims, mains as well as interview stage, you need to understand first why is there a need to scrap the old vehicles? What benefits we are going to derive from scrapping of old vehicles? And so there are a lot of reasons why when vehicles get 10 to 15 years old, we should scrap them and currently we are not. For example, the emissions, the bad emissions, the emissions which are going to cause a lot of harm to the environment including the poisonous gases as well as greenhouse gas emissions. The emission rate from old vehicles is very very high because when they were manufactured the emission standards were different. For example, if a vehicle today is 10 to 15 years old, it must have been BS2 compliant which is very very relaxed as compared to the current conditions BS6. So first and foremost for the benefit of the environment and hence for the benefit of everyone it is better that from time to time the vehicles are scrapped. Then the next perspective is safety. We know that around 1 lakh 40 to 50 thousand people die every year from road accidents and that is mainly because of the safety equipments on place in the vehicles. And just like the emission standards, the safety standards also change with time. And so we need vehicles which have higher safety standards. Then as the vehicles old, the fuel demand increases because their mileage is very very low and so they need to be replaced because India is largely dependent on imports as far as the crude oil is concerned and so that is another reason. And then finally, we know that a lot of automobile manufacturing goes on in India right now and especially in last one decade it has rapidly increased. But to manufacture automobile, you need components and you need raw materials. But if old vehicles ply on road, you have to derive these raw materials from fresh resources. For example, if we talk about steel or if we talk about plastic, it has to be procured as fresh. But what if older vehicles are scrapped and we can utilize the scrappage of the older vehicles to make the raw materials for the new vehicles? Will it not be cheaper to manufacture newer cars from the raw material being provided by the older vehicles? And so for all these reasons, the government of India has come up with vehicle scrappage policy. So under the policy, there are two things. First is the fitness testing. Without testing, you cannot judge a fitness of a vehicle. And so the criteria for a vehicle to be scrapped is primarily based on the fitness of vehicles. And that will be done through automated fitness centers. And the criteria is adapted from international best practices after a comparative study of standards from various countries like Germany, UK, US and Japan. Only if a vehicle fails the fitness test or fails to get the renewal of its registration certificate shall be declared as end of life vehicle. Now the criteria to determine if a vehicle's fitness has expired will be primarily based on emission tests, braking tests, safety as well as age. So four parameters shall determine the fitness of a vehicle and that should be done by automated fitness centers and these automated fitness centers can be opened up by state governments, by automakers and even by third party private companies. So what does this policy has to say about the scrappage? Why people are going to send their old vehicles for scrapping? All because it is very emotional decision for many Indians. And the simple answer to that is the incentives being proposed in the current policy. But before that, what are the conditions which will finally lead to the scrapping? 
So starting with the commercial vehicles which ply the most on the road and which have run the longest on the roads. So it is proposed that commercial vehicles be deregistered after 15 years in case of failure to get the fitness certificate. And as a distinctive measure, increased fees for fitness certificate and fitness test may be applicable for commercial vehicles 15 years onwards from the date of initial registration. Similarly, government has said in the policy that all vehicles of central government, state government, municipal corporation, panchayat, state transport undertakings, public sector undertakings and autonomous bodies with union and state governments may be deregistered and scrapped after 15 years. So commercial vehicles and government vehicles in 15 years and similarly private vehicles in 20 years if they fail to get the fitness or re-registering themselves. Now again coming back to the same question, why would people send their vehicles willingly to scrapping? That is because of the incentives. So the first incentive which has been thought in this policy is the scrap value for the old vehicle which will be given by the scrapping center which has been rated somewhere between 4 to 6 percent of X showroom price of the vehicle which is massive. So if a family has purchased a vehicle of 10 lakh rupees and after 10 years of usage if they get 40 to 60 thousand back that is very good but apart from that in the policy it has been thought that the central government would advise and would incentivize the state governments that they offer a road tax rebate of about 25 percent for the personal vehicles and 15 percent for commercial vehicles if the owners reproduce a scrapping certificate so if you have an old vehicle you scrap it you get a certificate and if you reproduce this certificate you might get road tax rebate and waiver on registration tax if you are purchasing a new vehicle after scrapping an old one so these are the incentives and so it is estimated that on a car which is worth around 10 lakh rupees the savings for scrapping and overall incentive would range between 1 to 1.5 lakh and so this is a big big boost as far as and especially as middle class families are concerned. And so the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways will promote setting up of registered vehicle scrapping facilities or the centers across India and will encourage public-private participation for opening up of more such centers. Similarly, efforts are also being made to set up integrated scrapping facilities across the country. Some of the identified places include Alang in Gujarat, which is already a scrapping yard for old ships. There is also an important provision in the policy which is that operators of fitness center shall only provide testing facility and shall not provide repair resale of spare services. So this has been done in order to avoid the conflict of interest. And so what shall be the benefit of such a policy? So clearly we can see that if more and more older vehicles are being scrapped and they are being replaced by newer vehicles, there is going to be a drastic reduction in pollution, especially in mega cities. It will also help improve fuel efficiency and reduce the pollution. Then it will also lead to reduction in the prices of newer vehicles. And this will be because of two reasons. First is because people will get incentive. And the second is because of the recycling of metal and plastic parts. As scrap materials will get cheaper, the production cost of vehicle manufacturer will also reduce. Then this policy also has a potential to improve the revenues for the government because this will boost the sales of heavy and medium commercial vehicles that have seen a lot of contraction in the wake of COVID-19 as well as bankruptcy of Island FS. The government treasury is expected to get around 30 to 40 thousand crore of money through GST collections only due to the scrappage policy. And then finally, it will lead to a massive massive employment creation. Because first, a lot of testing and scrapping centers will have to come up in order to abide by these new policy and so it will lead to creation of more and more scrapyards in the country and will lead to effective recovery of waste from older vehicles and so in the new fitness centers around 35,000 to 50,000 people will get employed and we are expecting around 10,000 crores worth of investment by mega firms. So from the perspective of UPSC prelims and mains examination, the features are very very important as well as the benefits to be arrived from vehicle scrappage policy. Let us now move on to the next discussion. Iran deal could be rescued by IAEA appears on page number 7, where the author talks about a new initiative by IAEA which may help to find an alternative to JCPOA in the changed circumstances. Now in this regard, 
This is an opportune time for us to visit the Iran nuclear deal starting with the historical context. Now the points raised by the author in this particular editorial are not very relevant from the perspective of UPSC examination. But what we can do is that we can utilize this opportunity to try and understand the Iran nuclear deal or GCPOA mechanism. And for that, we'll have to start from the 1970s. And for that, we'll have to first understand that why is it that Iran wants to enrich its uranium supplies where did it start its nuclear program and very briefly we'll go through last 30 to 40 years and which are going to provide a broader perspective and understanding into the Iran nuclear deal. Now this discussion is going to be extremely extremely useful both for mains as well as interview stage. You could be asked the historical context of Iran nuclear deal. You could be asked about the enrichment program of Iran. And then finally, the American withdrawal and recent announcement of the newly elected president of United States, Mr. Joe Biden, expressing his opinion that United States will soon again join the Iran nuclear deal or JCPOA mechanism. And so we will start today's discussion by first understanding why is there need for any country in general and Iran in particular to enrich its uranium resources. So we all know that a nuclear weapon uses a fissile material to cause a nuclear chain reaction. And the most commonly used materials are uranium-235 and plutonium-239 which are the isotopes of uranium and plutonium respectively. Now the problem is that plutonium is almost non-existent in nature. Whereas the natural uranium is about 99.3% uranium-238 which is non-fissile. Whereas the fissile or the uranium which can be used to make a nuclear weapon is only 0.7% of overall uranium resource on earth. Therefore, to make a weapon, either uranium must be enriched because such a low quantity of fissile material is not going to give results in the form of nuclear weapon. So either you need to enrich uranium or you need to produce plutonium. And so that is why you need to enrich uranium so that whenever you extract a natural uranium, you know that it is going to be only less than 1% of what you need. And so you need to increase the amount of uranium-235 and that is what the enrichment is. But we also know that uranium enrichment can also produce power or electricity. And that is why uranium enrichment is a dual use technology, a technology which can be used both for civilian and for military purposes. Now the amount of uranium or plutonium needed depends on the sophistication of the design. With a simple design requiring approximately 15 kg of uranium or 6 kg of plutonium. And a sophisticated design requiring as little as 9 kg of uranium or 2 kg of plutonium. And so if Iran or any other country wants to manufacture nuclear bombs or nuclear weapons, they are going to need at least 20 kgs of uranium per weapon for a single nuclear bomb. This is the amount they are going to need at least. And so that is why just like most other countries, the nuclear program of Iran was started in 1970s. Iranian development of nuclear technology began in 1970s when the United States Atoms for Peace program began providing assistance to Iran which was then led by Shah which was pro-American during the Cold War. So you can see how in most of the crises of the world which United States is fighting right now in the last two decades have their genesis or some kind of association with United States in the past. Iran also signed the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons or NPT in 1968 as a non-nuclear weapon state and ratified it in 1970s. But in 1979, Iran went through a revolution. Iranian revolution took place in 1979 and Iran's nuclear program which had developed some baseline capacity fell to disarray as much of Iran's nuclear talent fled the country in the wake of revolution. Apart from that, Ayatollah Khomeini, who was the supreme leader of Iran back then, he was initially opposed to nuclear technology and also Iran engaged in costly war with Iraq from 1980s to 88. So revolution led to the fleeing of top scientists from the country and also at the same time Iran engaged with Iraq in a very very costly war and so the funds were diverted away from nuclear technology or from nuclear research and so that is why there was a pause in Iran's nuclear program for 10 years. But then in 1980s 
Iran reinstated its nuclear program with assistance from Pakistan, which entered into a bilateral agreement with Iran in 1992, with China in 1990s, and with Russia in 1995. And there was an active support from a Pakistani nuclear scientist, A. Q. Khan. And so Iran began pursuing an indigenous nuclear fuel cycle capability by developing a uranium mining infrastructure and experimenting with uranium conversion and enrichment. So you can say that the revival of Iran's nuclear program in 1990s began with an anti-West collaboration or alliance. You can see China and Russia actively participating along with Pakistan in helping Iran to develop nuclear capabilities. All this was hidden from the world. But within 10 years, a lot of intelligence being gathered by developed countries, especially America, and people fleeing Iran started to report active nuclear program going on in Iran. In August 2002, the Paris-based National Council of Residents of Iran, which was an Iranian dissident group, publicly revealed the existence of two undeclared nuclear facilities, the Arak Heavy Water Production Facility and Natanz Enrichment Facility. And when more intelligence was gathered, it was found out that at Arak, there is a research center and heavy water production which is going to be needed in nuclear program. Then Fordow Uranium Enrichment and Research Center, Natanz Uranium Enrichment and Research, Ishfahan Research and Uranium Conversion and Manufacturing Center, and then at Bushehr Nuclear Energy Production Center. All these were very very active in Iranian nuclear program. And so the world began to worry about these massive, massive headway which Iran had already made in field of nuclear science. And so the permanent members of United Nations Security Council, led by United States, started to put pressure on Iran. And so in 2003, under the circumstances of global pressures, Iran entered into an agreement. That was the first time not only Iran officially recognized the existence of active nuclear program, but also entered into an agreement. Under this declaration, Iran agreed to cooperate fully with IAEA, signed additional protocol and temporarily suspended all uranium enrichment programs. This was the agreement between Iran and EU3 or France, Germany and UK. But this agreement was not long lasting and there were some internal changes in the politics, the new government came and in 2006 Iran ended its voluntary implementation of additional protocol and resumed enrichment at Natanz, prompting the IAEA Board of Governors to refer Iran to United Nations Security Council. After the vote, Iran announced it would resume its enrichment of uranium and in April 2006, Ahmadi Nijad, the then president of Iran, announced that Iran had nuclear technology but said that it was purely for power generation and not for weapons. But everyone knew that this was just a smoke screen to create more and more nuclear weapons. And after the backtrack of Iran, the sanctions were imposed by most western countries led by America. Because of which Iran's economy suffered years of recession, currency depreciation and inflation largely because of sanction on its energy sector. Because of these extreme sanctions and intervention and mediation by various countries, Iran finally entered into an agreement with P5 plus 1 which is called JCPOA or Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So as you can see on the screen, these are the signatures of all the consenting parties and this is what was agreed in JCPOA in 2015. It was agreed that the sanctions would be removed against Iran if it abides by following restrictions. For example, the centrifuges which ultimately result in enrichment. The number of them was capped at 6000 whereas earlier Iran had 19,138. Similarly, the advanced centrifuges were capped to zero which means that Iran cannot have access and will not import any of the advanced centrifuges from across the world. And even if through research and development, Iran wants to manufacture its own advanced centrifuges, there are a lot of constraints put on it. How much stockpile of low enriched uranium Iran can have, that was capped at 300 kgs. 
स्टॉक पाइल ऑफ मीडियम एनरिच यूरेनियम विच इज अ वेपन ग्रेड यूरेनियम वॉज कैप्ड एट जीरो विच मीन्स ईरान कैनॉट हैव इवन वन ग्राम ऑफ स्टॉक पाइल ऑफ मीडियम एनरिच यूरेनियम वेर एज अर्लियर इन द टू थाउजेंड थ्री अग्रीमेंट इट वॉज कैप्ड एट वन नाइनटी सिक्स के जी सो यू कैन सी द रीजनेबल रिस्ट्रिक्शन वर पुट ऑन ईरान एंड दीज वर नॉट टू डिटर द ईरान्स पाथ टूवर्ड्स न्यूक्लियर टेक्नोलॉजी बट इट वॉज जस्ट मैन टू डिले इट फॉर लाइक टेन टू फिफ्टीन टू ट्वेंटी ईयर्स बट इवन बिफोर दैट अमेरिका और यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका लेड बाई मिस्टर ट्रम्प विद्रू फ्रॉम दिस जे सी पी ओ ए अग्रीमेंट इन टू थाउजेंड एंड एटीन and so iran accused the united states of going back on its commitments and faulted europe for submitting to us unilateralism because it was agreed that for next 10 to 15 years all the sides will abide by it and iran was abiding by this deal but mr trump did not like that iran was allowed to have even a single gram of low enriched uranium and he wanted to capture everything which was not possible for any country to promise and so when the us withdrew the other signatories of the deal stepped up their game and so in order to keep the agreement alive france germany and united kingdom launched a barter program a barter system known as ins tex to facilitate transactions with iran outside of the us banking system because us had again imposed the sanctions after its withdrawal and so no one would even dare to do business with iranian company because it will be banned so if a company a registered in india comes into an agreement or does transactions with a company b which is registered in iran this company would also be banned and we know that ultimately all the financial systems are interconnected so americans would know and so they had to create a parallel system of transaction which is shielded from american system however the system is only meant for food and medicine which are already exempt from us sanctions so not much helpful and so following the us withdrawal several countries which are mainly us allies continued to import iranian oil under the waivers granted by the trump administration and iran so far has continued to abide by these commitments but a year later united states ended the waivers with aim to halting iran's oil exports completely and this is the reason why india has also halted iran's oil import when the exemptions were ended the waivers were ended and iran had no choice and so in response to the other party's actions tehran claimed that these amounted to breaches of the deal iran started exceeding agreed upon limits to its stockpile of low enriched uranium in 2019 and began enriching uranium to higher concentrations now recently mr joe biden has expressed its opinion that us might join back the jcpoa mechanism now whatever author suggests which are various available mechanisms of iaea which can be used instead of jcpoa is not relevant over here because when america joins jcpoa all the sanctions will automatically be withdrawn and iran is also likely to resume the restrictions which were imposed by the treaty as far as iran nuclear deal and jcpoa mechanism is concerned this discussion was needed to make you understand the full context in which we talk about the nuclear treaties This is the editorial article from page number eight, rising poverty. The article is based on the study by Pew Research Center on change in living standard in the context of distress induced by COVID-19. This study by Pew Research Center estimates that India's middle class may have shrunken by one third. Middle class in the report has been taken as people with income of. 10 to 20 dollar per day converted into rupee this will be approximately 700 to 1500 rupees per day and the report estimates that the number of poor people in india has risen by 7.5 crore poor has been defined as people with income 2 dollar or less a day but what is more important to observe from the report is this rise in 7.5 crore people in india is 60% of global increase in poverty this editorial article highlights that in contrast to these numbers from india china has done considerably well the drop in the middle class of china is very minuscule only around 1 crore people an increase in the number of poor people is only by 10 lakh compared to 7.5 crore in india but this must not come as a surprise Previously when the GDP numbers came out for the first quarter after COVID-19 pandemic eruption we saw that for India the number was 23.9% negative 
and most of the countries registered negative growth in that phase. But at that point in time, China registered positive growth of 3.2%. Perhaps because of information asymmetry, but whatever the reason be, rising poverty is a great concern. It is one of the biggest governance challenge in the coming time. I must also tell you that there is an underlining assumption in preparing this report. The assumption is the impact of COVID-19 has been borne equally by all class. But there has been reports and data to suggest that inequality actually has risen during the time of COVID-19 pandemic. So if inequality is factored in, the numbers will be even higher than what has been reported in the study. In this study, the data has not been collected directly. It is an estimation. So actually, the 7.5 crore people falling below the poverty line could be much higher. According to the Oxfam report of 2019, inequality was already alarmingly high even before eruption of COVID-19 pandemic. In India, top 1% held 51.5% of national wealth. However, the inequality virus report that Oxfam International has recently released, according to that, COVID-19 has deeply increased the existing inequality. And the rich, they were able to escape COVID-19's worst impact. The inequality virus report of Oxfam also has highlighted that Indian billionaires have increased 35% during the lockdown. People in white-collar jobs, they had the luxury to work from home. And that class quickly adapted to the situation. But there were many in the informal system. People working in gig economy, people working in economy as fruit and vegetable sellers, daily wage earners, the migrant workers, they could not adopt to the situation. And the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy estimated that the loss of job when the lockdown was imposed was around 140 million. People have been distressed during COVID-19 in various ways. People who lost jobs in the informal sector, obviously they did not have any social security. Around 40 to 50 million seasonal migrant workers, they had to do distressed reverse migration back home. So the rural households that were dependent on remittances coming from the urban areas, they came under huge financial distress. The unemployment number rose to highest in the last decade to 6%. And more than men, women suffered. The unemployment rate among women was already high. It was around 15%. At the time of COVID-19, when the lockdown norms were fully imposed, it rose to 18%. It has been estimated that this unemployment of women can result in loss to India's GDP by around 8%. Also, according to one of the surveys that was conducted by Institute of Social Studies Trust, women who retained their job, they had to face as much as 83% cut in their salary. The distress was also in terms of health services. The primary healthcare centers, the Anganwadi centers, they were not fully functional. Materials of basic hygiene, they were not available for women. Schools were shut down. Midday meal scheme was discontinued in most of the schools. The nutritional need of children, they were immensely affected. On top of that, we know that child labor also increased to meet the income and food need of the household. The time of COVID-19 has also worsened the digital divide. According to the annual status of education report, only about one third of children could have access to online education. And only a small percentage of that could actually attend live classes because of various reasons. Maybe not having proper internet connectivity or for the reason of not having gadget individually for all children at home. These have resulted to a great loss of human capital. Increase in child labor, decrease in the fulfillment of nutritional need of children, poor learning outcome, these are going to take a toll on nation's future human capital. And that loss could be much bigger than what we are seeing now. United Nations Development Program has come up with a study recently in which it has been estimated that an additional 207 million people can be pushed into extreme poverty by 2030 due to the severe long-term impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Globally, extreme poverty is considered to be the condition where income is less than $1.9 per day. But according to the price level of 2011, 
In the current time, this has to be translated to the present price level and it will come approximately to $2.2 per day. Condition in future is expected to become even more severe. So a strategy both economic and political has to be developed to deal with the situation. Globally, the central banks, they are taking dovish stand, meaning they are easing the interest rate. The economic strategy globally is to focus on economic growth. This year's economic survey also has given the opinion that both economic growth as well as inequality, they have similar relation with regard to socio-economic indicators. However, economic survey has batted for this. Economic growth has a far greater impact on poverty elevation than inequality. Meaning you have to focus on economic growth. When the economy grows, the pie that has to be shared with everybody in the nation becomes larger. So everyone's share will also increase. In terms of governance strategy, it will translate like this. Focus has to be more on economic growth, meaning you have to improve the ease of doing business. You have to bring reforms. You have to give tax incentives to the corporate so that they bring in more money for investment and the growth cycle is revived. Lesser focus would be given to inequality, meaning the cash transfer, direct benefit transfer, subsidies, they have to be used prudently and fiscal and monetary policy has to focus on reviving economic growth. The opinion on the other side can be that since people have fallen below the poverty line, people are under distress. So measures like direct benefit transfers, subsidies in the form of food subsidy or otherwise, that must be continued. Otherwise, this inequality, we will be slipping on this. In the next mains examination, it could become a very important question as to what strategy do you think is better to focus on economic growth or to focus on inequality. The stand that economic survey has taken is unambiguous, is unequivocal. It has very clearly said that you have to focus on economic growth, but you must know the arguments on the other side as well to be able to write a balanced answer. There is an article on page number 14, Philippines accuses China of incursion in disputed sea, with sea, the South China Sea. There are various claims and disputes in the South China Sea and there have been multiple conflicts and confrontation of China with other countries in the region. There is a larger geostrategic significance of South China Sea where China is trying to establish its hegemony. Discussion on South China Sea from the perspective of civil service examination we have done multiple times previously in the DNS. I am appending one video here for your reference just in case you need a revision. Indo-Pacific in general and South China Sea in particular has recently emerged as the geopolitical center of gravity. And the importance of South China Sea lies in the one-third of the world trade which transits through this sea. Further, it has rich oil and natural gas resources and it accounts for about 10% of the world's fishery. However, the South China Sea has recently become a region of contestation among the coastal states which surround it. So as you can see in this map, the location of South China Sea and the countries which are surrounding this South China Sea. So mainly it is surrounded by China, Vietnam, Philippines and various other countries. And accordingly, all these countries have been asserting their rights in the South China Sea's waters. However, it is the China which has asserted itself to be the most important power in the South China Sea. And it has claimed about 90% of the area of South China Sea with its conception of the nine dash line. So in this map, you can see that China has asserted its rights on 90% of the South China Sea by conceptualizing this nine dash line. So it covers mainly the 90% of the South China Sea region. Further, besides China, the United States of America has increased its military presence in the region under the concept of freedom of navigation operations. And it has done so in order to enforce the rule-based navigation of high seas, which is in accordance with the UN Convention on Law of Seas. And the principle of freedom of navigation under the UN clause provides for free movement of vessels in the high seas. So this has increased the military presence of United States of America in the South China Sea. Now, besides these military powers, Japan has also asserted its rights as a result of the disputed Senkaku and Diodo Islands. 
Further, the Philippines, Vietnam have emerged as regional players and they have asserted their rights in the Spratly and the Paracel Islands. So in this map, you can see all these important locations which have been contested amongst various countries. So for example, the Pratas Island, the Paracel Island, the Spratly Islands, the Scarborough Shoal and the Senkaku and the Diodo Islands. So all these locations are important for us from the preliminary examination point. Now, besides these contested islands between different countries, there are other players which include Malaysia, Indonesia and Brunei. Now, what is the power game that is going on in the South China Sea? So, we see that Indo-Pacific has emerged as the center of gravity of geopolitics and the United States of America has increased its presence in region both in terms of economics and the military presence. Further, China in the past decade has challenged the hegemony of US in the region by asserting its dominance through the Nine Dash Line claiming the South China Sea to be its territorial waters. And China has also increased its military presence which has resulted in confrontations with the littoral states like the Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, etc. Now in this background, various concerns have been raised regarding the future of Indo-Pacific region because of the transformation of relationship that is going on between US and China because of the assertion of China in the South China Sea. Further, the Chinese assertion is visible in its ballistic missile tests which were conducted recently in the South China Sea. Now due to the impact of COVID-19, US might reduce its presence in the South China Sea which will further embolden China's intentions. So in this power game that is going on between South China Sea and the transformation in the power game which is being witnessed because of the COVID-19 pandemic in this sea, let us look at its relevance for India. Now India and Southeast Asian countries mainly which are part of the ASEAN have always treated the South China Sea as a global common. And accordingly, the Chinese claim on the South China Sea as its territorial waters does not stand the scrutiny of the global commons. Further, it has acted as an important sea lane of communication historically and India had its trading presence from Kedda in Malaysia to Kwanzhou in China. Further, we note that India's trading relationship and partnership with the ASEAN countries has been increasing. So in this background, the security of South China Sea is very important for India's interests. And we note that nearly $200 billion of our trade passes through the South China Sea. And also, many Indian citizens study, work and invest in ASEAN countries as well as China, Japan and Republic of Korea. So in this background, it can be clearly said that we have stakes in the peace and security of this region in common with the others who reside this region. And as such, the freedom of navigation as well as other normal activities with the friendly countries are essential for our economic well-being. Now, some of the points that we have discussed here have been highlighted by a former diplomat of India. And he further says that regional arrangements will become even more important for our economic recovery and rejuvenation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And if India intends to think global and act local, India has to be part of the global supply chain in the world's leading growth region for the next half century. And for this, India needs to play a proactive role in regional arrangements like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And because the value of such agreements goes beyond the economic gains that they generate for India or the region. So this means that India needs to be a part of the various regional arrangements and they can be very important for India in pursuing its interests in the region and especially in the South China Sea which is a very important region for India from its security both economic as well as territorial. There is an article on page number 9 related to unpaid work. How to treat unpaid work? This actually is very important question and I believe in some form it can be asked in the next mains examination. This issue is appearing in newspaper over and over again and we have elaborately covered it in our explained series in the discussion video of first week of March. The unpaid household care work that women have to do, should they, should not they be paid for it, what will be the pros and cons? All aspects surrounding this issue has been discussed elaborately. Make sure you prepare a good succinct pithy notes on this. In case you have not been through this issue, then please refer to this discussion video.